Critical thinking for Christians. Actually, critical thinking for anybody would be a, a good title for this. It seems to be a skill that's disappearing in our society today. Everything's emotions, everything's reacting on a gut level, and we don't think through things. Everything's fast today. Everything's quick, everything's superficial, everything's shallow. And so this is a skill that we really want to develop. Now, I mentioned critical thinking for Christians in particular because Christians, unfortunately, and I don't think fairly, have been labeled as non-thinkers. And uh, I don't think that's the case. I hope you don't feel it's that way after some of the issues that we've been talking about in here. This is going to be a little bit different today. Instead of a theological issue, a historical issue, something to do with the credibility of the Gospels or anything like that, this is going to be maybe a, a refresher for some of you who uh, got a lot of this in school. But we want to talk about what are the skills for people so that they can interact with their society in a clear and thoughtful way. I thought maybe we could start with this, the people who lack critical thinking skills. So let's talk about that for just a, a few minutes here. For one thing, the ones who do not practice crit good critical thinking are often swayed by emotional language. And uh, think about how popular that is today. Sometimes that's called connotation. That's the emotional meaning that a word has. Denotation is a dictionary definition. You look up the word um, Adolf Hitler, for, exa uh, for example, and what do you find out? Chancellor of Germany from 1933 to 1945, something like that. But that doesn't give you the, the full range of emotions that come about. If you call somebody a Hitler or you suggest that's a, a Hitler idea, they're not talking about the Chancellor of Germany. They're talking about those emotional uh, gut-wrenching reactions that we have to the word Hitler. We think of genocide, we think of brutality, we think of uh, maniacal uh, devotion to a terrible cause. And so when we talk about emotional language, we want to be careful, we want to be aware of it. It's used all the time. I give an example here of um, a, a housing tract. Suppose a housing tract, brand new homes, uh, scrape the land bare to put these homes in, but they call it whispering oaks. Can you hear that emotional reaction? Whispering oaks. It just sounds wonderful. You can just see these big stately oak trees and the wind gently whistling through it. it. Makes you feel warm and fuzzy. Makes you feel like, boy, I'd love to live there. And then you go and you visit that site. It's scraped off land. It's homes, no landscaping. Very, very different. But they've gotten to you. They've gotten to your heart because of emotional language. We see it in, in politics. We see it certainly in advertising, as they say, in advertising, sell the sizzle, not the steak. So it's not necessarily the product, it's the emotional language. Uh, in some of my classes out of co at the college I teach at, uh, we'll take a look at car names, for instance. And so many of the car names today, Jaguar, Mustang, whatever it is, they, they give you that emotional feel, whether or not they're good cars, but that wonderful sensation, Malibu, uh, a location. So emotional language is with us. We're not going to get rid of it. I'm, that's not my point today. But those who do not critically think through things are often um, swept along emotionally by language. We want to be careful about that. Secondly, people who don't have good critical thinking skills really don't have good resources. So uh, you know if you go to my Apologetics for Life website, that's Gary at Apologetics for Life. Dot org. I'll be glad to send you some resources, but I got resources that are listed as well there in case you'd like to follow up on that. But people without critical thinking skills don't know the websites to go to, don't know what books might be good, certainly don't have them up on their bookshelf. They don't know what DVDs, they don't have magazines that might help them sort through difficult issues. Third, people who lack critical thinking skills don't read very well. And I came across this statistic, 50% of Americans can't write, uh, read a book that's written at an 8th grade level. Not exactly higher ed, not exactly college type of material, 8th grade level. And half of Americans can't read it. Half. That's just an astounding statistic. Think of how much money is poured into our educational system. And this is the kind of result we have. Well. Uh, I'm not here today to gripe about the educational system, but just it's a fact of life. So people who do not critically think well don't read very well. And I see that out of college over and over and over again. I ask the students who don't write well and don't think well, so how much do you read? 
and very, very rarely do, do I find anybody that does a lot of reading. Fourth thing that might be a characteristic of somebody lacking critical thinking skills, they believe all they hear. They can't distinguish between things that are coming into them all the time via the internet, via television, on the job, whatever it is. They, they'll hear things like this, well, I heard this thing, whatever it is, I just called it X. I heard this thing, it must be true. It was on TV. It must be true, they're talking about it on the internet. It must be true, people at the office seem to believe that. Of course, that's not the case at all, is it? There's a lot of misinformation that's out there. Okay, so th these are some of the things that people who lack critical thinking skills will have as their characteristics. Here's some others. I just want you to match yourself up with some of these. Think about these things. People who lack thinking skills have a rigid outlook on life. There's that old joke, my mind's made up, so don't confuse me with the facts. Boy, that's more true than you'd think. People don't want to change their minds. They hang around people who think the same as them. They read things that only agree with them. They watch television that only agrees with them. They have a very rigid outlook. They're inside this little box and they don't want to get outside and see what's going on. Another problem with people who don't have critical thinking skills, they're not up to date on the world. Many of them don't know what's going on in the area of science, for example. You tell them things, uh, I'll just throw one out here from a Christian perspective, you tell them, you know, evolution's had some serious problems over the last 10, 20 years. Well, they don't know that, they just heard when they grew up the evolution was true, and there you go. Uh, there are a lot of cracks in evolution, but they may not have heard about them. They're not up on movies. Now, does that mean I'm asking everybody to go out and become a movie uh, fan? No. But we ought to be aware, so we can talk with friends and neighbors, what are the themes that are out there? What are the messages that are coming across in these movies? I'm not asking people to become uh, Brad Pitt uh, fanatics or anything like that, but I'm just saying we ought to know what's capturing America's attention in their movies. A lot of it's uh, pretty depressing, but we need to know that. Music, we don't know what's going on in the field of music these days. And uh, politics, people hear sound bites, they hear these little tiny bits fed to them, and they don't really know what's going on. What are some of the major moves that are happening in the world of politics? Here's another thing people may have as far as lacking critical thinking skills. They don't recognize the difference between facts and opinions. Everybody's got opinions, but not everybody has facts to back them up. So they hear things like this, X, whatever it is, is the best soap, or this is the best candidate, or this is the best uh, TV show that you could watch. This is the best book that you should read. We hear things like that and we go, oh, okay. Yeah, but maybe we haven't really thought about, well, that's just an opinion. What are the facts supporting that? They can't evaluate evidence very well. A book comes out and claims that Jesus never lived and they say, well, I don't know. This person has a PhD. Maybe that's the case. Do you remember years ago, The Da Vinci Code came out by Dan Brown. At the very beginning, Dan Brown, before he tells the story, he's got a section that says, everything reported here as far as the kinds of organizations and the written documents, all these things are true. And so people said, oh, well, that's, that must be accurate. Dan Brown says he's looked at the evidence. Well, there were huge holes in that book, but people didn't know that because they didn't know how to evaluate the evidence that was there. Another thing they can't do is they can't recognize logical errors. We're going to come across this a little bit later and talk about it. But people simply don't know logical errors. When somebody says to him or her, boy, you Christians are really arrogant. They often don't know how to respond to that. They don't see that that's actually a logical problem for the person who made the claim. And instead they say, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not arrogant. I, I'm a nice person. And they throw up a defense there that they didn't have to do. They could just simply have pointed out a logical problem with that. So that's, these are just some of the things that people uh, have as characteristics if they're not real critical thinkers. Well, let's now walk our way through, and this will go with your outline here, let's walk our way through what some of the characteristics are of a good critical thinker. So, first thing, critical thinkers don't just absorb stuff. They are involved.
they interact with people, and the best way you can show interest in somebody, the best way you can interact with somebody, the best way to connect is to ask questions. We always want to throw answers out or we run away. Oftentimes we can just simply ask questions. And I think two of the most important questions we can ask, first one is, what do you mean by that? And the second one is, how did you come to that conclusion or why do you believe that? Now, why are these powerful questions? Well, first, the question, what do you mean by that, just says, I'd like to make sure I understand what you're saying. Why would we interact with somebody if we're not really sure what the person is trying to get across? So we want to interact with that, that person, and this makes the other person feel uh, justified and feel, feel honored by you and feel respected by you if you'll say, oh, that's interesting. What do you mean by that? Could I get some clarification? So here are a couple of examples. Somebody says, oh, you Christians are so narrow-minded. So we ask that question, what do you mean narrow-minded? And let's see what happens. Maybe the person just means, well, you think you're right. Of course, that could be flipped around, couldn't it? Well, don't you think you're right? But I don't understand. If you're right, that just means you're right. But if I think I'm right, that makes me narrow-minded. Could you explain to me? That's sort of odd, isn't it? So we ask for definitions. What do you mean by that? Somebody says to you, the Bible's been changed. I don't really trust the Bible. The Bible's been changed over the years. Well, this person may be mixing up translations of the Bible. And of course, the Bible's been translated. But maybe the person has a more sinister... And then we could just clear that up, couldn't we? Because we say, oh, sure, the Bible's been translated. But the person may actually be meaning... I think somebody took information out of the Bible and plugged in false information. Oh, that's very different. And it requires a very different kind of answer. But we only know that if we ask questions first. How about the other question? Why do you believe that? So the person's made a claim. Now we understand it. That's that first question. We're asking for understanding. Okay, I get it. Then we say, all right, now I think I know what you're saying. I think I figured out your claim. Why do you believe that? What's your evidence? Why do you say that? You don't have to say it in a snotty way. We're not saying that you're attacking the person. You say, oh, that's interesting. You think X. All right, then, then why do you think that? So somebody says to you, <clears throat> well, evolution, <clears throat> excuse me, evolution has been proved. Okay. We, we say, really? H how, do you, how do you know that? Where, where have you read that? What do you mean it's been proved? In what way? So put the, put the burden back on the person who's made the claim. That's only fair. Why should you have to defend your position? They're the ones that have made the claim. So you're just saying, okay, you made a claim. Give me the evidence. Again, you say it in a very nice way. We're not talking about a mean-spirited argument here. How about this question? There is no God. Okay, we understand. We got clarification. We don't have to ask the first question. Okay, we get it. You don't think there's a God out there. But why would you say that? What, what's your evidence that there's no God? Maybe it's a personal hurt that that person has gone through. Maybe it's uh, some Christian has done something awful to him or her. Maybe it's actually a, a philosophical argument. Maybe it's a scientific issue. We don't know until we say, what's your reason? Why do you believe that? So these are excellent questions, two questions. Everybody in here I get very comfortable in asking as you interact with people out in the world. Critical thinkers also need to read well. Pretty obvious, I know. But they do need to read well. And so I made a list here of just some things that I talk about with my students at, a, at the community college where I teach. One thing a reader does is anticipate. Most of my students tell me when they get an assignment, they just go home and sit down and, and they flip through the pages because the teacher assigned it. But I say, wait a minute. You ought to be anticipating what you're supposed to do. Is this going to be on a test? Is this going to be part of a class discussion? Is this just for background information? Who wrote this article? Do you know anything about the person? Does it have like subheadings so you can kind of anticipate? You look through it and see what the, the main points appear to be. But you ask yourself questions. Who's the publisher? What's the purpose of what you're reading? Is it a political tract to try to get you to change your mind? Is it something that's trying to scare you? 
Is it something that's trying to make you laugh? What, what's the purpose behind this material that you're reading? So this is before you've even read a page of it. It's just to begin to figure out why, why am I reading this? What's the point of this? So something else that we can do is have a pen as we're reading and annotate, mark up what we're going through. So if we're reading something, we say, well, that's exactly what my, my dad told me before. You write, dad said this. Or you read something and you say, this part doesn't make any sense. I'm lost. Or, oh, this is the second of four points. So you circle that where it says second. That's what I tend to do. I, if somebody tells me I have several reasons as I'm reading, I have several reasons for the following position, and I find the first, I'll circle it. I don't even read the first. I'll, I'll flip through till I see where it says second. I circle that. So now I can see the big pictures. I'm working my way through articles. So good readers, good uh, critical thinkers are good readers, and they annotate. They interact. It keeps them focused rather than just reading. You ever read something, and you, you read five, ten pages, and you said, well, I read it, and I don't remember anything. Well, it could be that you didn't annotate, you didn't have that pen in hand and, and interacted and kept yourself focused on what it was you were reading. Third thing is, as you're reading, you understand, a good reader understands the material. Now, that sounds pretty obvious, but many times we come across a reference to a person, we come across a reference to an event, we come across a reference to a particular place, and we say, I don't know, and we keep going. Well, even if we don't look it up then, we should check it out later. If we can't figure it out in the context of what we're reading, we need to check on the words. We need to check on those places, the people, the events, whatever it is, and lock that away. And then finally, and we're going to see this in a, the next slide in just a second, <clears throat> a good reader can figure out where the big ideas are in an essay. So what do I mean by that? Well, take a look at this. When we're reading an essay, there are three basic parts that we're looking for. Any kind of essay that we're reading. Now, not always, but I'm going to say generally, there will be some sort of introductory portion. It might be a single paragraph, it might be two or three paragraphs. It just depends how long the whole essay is. But there's going to be some kind of introductory part that we want to focus on. We want to look at that very closely because it will probably, again, not always, it will probably have the main point the reason this person wrote this article, and that's called a thesis statement. It may not be a single sentence, but we'll figure it out if we spend a little more time, look very closely at that introduction. So someplace in there, we want to find out what's this person talking about. So once we figure that out, then we come across, this just shows two, but let's say you had five or 10 or 15, what are called body paragraphs, where the person is trying to prove whatever it is the thesis is all about. So what, what do we do there? Well, we look very carefully at the topic sentence. Now, again, they won't always be there, but we want to slow down and read the intro sentence for every one of those body paragraphs because that may be the spot where the, re where the reader can figure out the main point of what's coming up in that particular paragraph. And then there will be supporting sentences to illustrate the reasons why the person believes that topic sentence is the case. So what do we do? We read carefully here. We read carefully when we get to those body paragraphs, the topic sentence. And then we read carefully when we get down near the conclusion because it tends to be the place, again, not always, but it tends to be the place where the writer reinforces, reminds us, repeats the main point of what the entire essay is. So how do we read a lengthy essay? Well, spend time, slow down here at the beginning, spend time on those topic sentences, and then spend time at the conclusion. <clears throat> Look for things like repetition, too. If you see a phrase repeated, that must be important. So slow down. Make sure you understand what that's all about. So that's reading an essay. What else do critical thinkers do? Well, they know what's going on in the world. Remember we talked about those who are not critical thinkers don't really uh, understand what the, what's happening out in the world. I'm just giving you one example. I like World Magazine. I think it's a great magazine. It has a section on sports. It has a section on movies. It has a section on music. It has a section on politics. It has a section on technology. So in a way, it's kind of a Time magazine or a Newsweek magazine, except it's aimed for Christians. So the perspective is from a Judeo-Christian worldview. So it, for example, the movies, they don't just, the movie reviews don't just say, uh, good movie, 
bad movie, nice acting, bad acting. But instead, they look at it from wearing the, the spectacles or the goggles of a Christian worldview. So what is that movie saying about life? What is that movie saying about religious matters? What is that movie saying about how to live our lives? What morality is coming through from that movie? So I, I hope you find that particular magazine useful. If not, there are others. Christianity Today is extremely popular. But we want to know what's going on in the world. We're in it. We should know science. We should know technology. We should know these kinds of things. We ought to know the difference between facts and opinions. Remember we said oftentimes a, a person who's not a critical thinker doesn't get the difference. So if you hear somebody say something like this, oh, she's a great boss. Do you notice that is an opinion? That's an opinion. There's no fact presented there. How many times on talk radio do we hear opinions? Well, about 99.9% .9 of the time, opinions reign. Everybody's got an opinion. <clears throat> but we don't have enough fact yet to, to back that up. So let's look at the next point here. When somebody makes that opinion or that assertion, we want to look for evidence. So if somebody says to you, well, I think she's a great boss. That's just the opinion. It's just an assertion. It's just a statement that's being made, of how a person feels about that boss. But look at the next line there. The company's stock value has written, risen 50% under her leadership. Do you notice the difference between she's a great boss and this information about the stocks? That seems to be a backup to support the main point there, which is, I think she's doing a good job. Why? Because this has happened to the stocks. There is some evidence to back up that uh, opinion. And finally, on this uh, slide here, critical thinkers do what? They listen to that evidence, they look for it, and when they see that evidence, they don't just say, oh, okay, well, there's the evidence. They evaluate the evidence. They have to decide, do I trust this or not? Is it relevant? Does it even tie into what we're talking about here? Who's the authority that's making this claim? Do you trust that person? Does it make sense? You've been out in the world, you experience things. Does this statement, this assertion, this evidence that's brought out, does that really make sense from what you've seen in the world today? So these are some of the things that critical thinkers do. What else? They watch out for things called self-refuting statements. Now, that's a fancy term, self-refuting. You can think of it as self-defeating, if you like that better. But people do these kinds of statements all the time. Let me give you an example of what a self-defeating or self-refuting uh, uh, self statement is, and then we'll take a look at this one here on the board. Somebody says to you, I can't speak a word of English. Well, wait a minute. That person just spoke a word of English. So they obviously can speak English. Somebody else comes up to you. Um, so that, that statement self-destructs. Can you see that? You don't have to pay any attention to that person because they're not thinking clearly. That statement doesn't reflect reality. Somebody else comes up to you and says, oh, I'm studying English. And you know what I found out? No English sentence can be more than four words long. No English sentence can be more than four words long. That's a whole lot more than four words, and yet that's an English sentence. So what happened to that statement? It's self-destructed. It did not obey its own rules. We don't have to pay attention to it. That's nonsense. It doesn't correspond to reality. So what about this? Somebody says to you, oh, you're being so judgmental. Now, if you've thought through what a self-defeating argument looks like, this is one. Why? Because the person is doing what? Is judging you and complaining that you're judgmental. And this happens. I, uh, somebody in one of the Sunday school classes I was teaching when we were talking about this raised his hand. He said at work the other day, he had a co-worker come in kind of flustered and upset and came in and sat down at her desk and she said, ah, oh, People drive me crazy. They're so judgmental. Well, there you go. So it does happen that way. So we look for those kinds of statements because they're out there. Um, I teach a class on uh, apologetics and tactics, and we talk about some of these problems that people get themselves into when they talk, and this is one of them. It's that uh, self-refuting statement. What else do critical thinkers do? Well, they're very careful 
when it comes to emotional language, being aware that people use it very often. I told you they use it in politics, they use it in advertising, they use it to get us to change our minds about things. So here's a little test, or not really a test, just an example. Look at the list of words that I have underneath there. Let's take that first set of words, average, mediocre. If we look those two words up in a dictionary, they'll mean the same thing. That means taken as a whole, this represents somebody who's sort of in the middle, not at either extreme, in the middle, average, mediocre. But I would suggest that there's a tremendous emotional gut level difference between these two. Which would you have rather been called in school, an average student or a mediocre student? Well, most of us would rather be called average. That has a better feel to it than mediocre, and yet they mean the same thing in the dictionary. So can you feel the differences in emotion between those two words? What about the next two? Childlike and childish. They both mean having the qualities of a child. So look them up in the dictionary, they'll be very close, but the emotional difference is there, isn't it? Isn't it far better to be called childish? I'm uh, sorry, wouldn't it be better to be called childlike than childish? Childish suggests tr tantrums and not getting your way and blowing up at everything. But that's not in the dictionary. Childish means like a child, having the qualities of a child. So look at the differences there. Third one, scrawny and slender. You see what I'm talking about there. They both mean thin, but one sounds more positive than the other. I'd rather be called slender than scrawny. Determined and stubborn. Same thing in the dictionary, but uh, most people would rather be called determined. That sounds good. Stubborn sounds like a mule. Sounds like you won't do the obvious thing. How about shrewd and cunning? Shrewd is better than cunning, isn't it? So look at these, and this is just a small sample of these things out in the world. We want to be aware of them so that people do not manipulate us, so they don't get to our wallets, so they don't get our vote, just because they can use emotional language. I'm old enough, I remember when Ronald Reagan ran for re-election in 1984. His motto for his, uh, his uh, campaign was, uh, it's morning again in America. Now, do you see how that's emotional language? By itself, it gives you no reason to vote for Ronald Reagan. But it makes you feel good. And so you'd see an image of a flag blowing and, or whatever it was, it's morning again in America. So watch out for these things, they're out there. The other thing a critical thinker does is he or she knows how to, where to go to get some resources. And I mentioned before, you can contact me Gary at apologeticsforlife.org. You can go to my website, apologeticsforlife.org. And there are a lot of places you can go to. You can find lists of DVDs, uh, good books to get, good magazines to read, good websites to take a look at. So what else can critical thinkers do? Remember uh, a little earlier I said to watch out for logical errors, people that don't understand logical fallacies. So let's run through some of the more common ones just to be aware, be, be ready for these. Let me stop there. Let's go back and do that one. So 222, 238, so I had 16, 16, and 12, 28. Okay, so. <clears throat> so what else can critical thinkers do? They can spot logical errors. Remember we talked before? about uh, logical problems that people can get themselves into. So let's just go through some of the more obvious ones. There are many more than these, but these are the ones that you and I are going to encounter the rest of our lives. Here's one, it's called jumping to conclusions. And you've heard that before, oh, don't jump to conclusions. So what does it mean? Well, somebody says something like this, I have a Christian friend who's a hypocrite, so I don't trust Christians. Do you see how they have jumped from one case way too far, they've, they've made two, too quick a conclusion that if you meet one, that person represents everybody. And we see this often. People will say things like this. Well, I gave up on going to church. Why is that? Oh, because I went one Sunday and uh, the person who was sitting over there was somebody I'd had business dealings with in the past and hadn't treated me very well. Really, you're going to reject the entire Christian church because of one person. That's jumping to conclusions. That's logically, uh, doesn't make any sense. It's uh, logical nonsense. 
Here's something that's got a Latin phrase to it. It's called non sequitur. It means it doesn't follow. Somebody says, why study math? I don't want to be a math teacher. Wait a minute. That doesn't follow from what the person was asking you to consider about doing well in math. It doesn't follow that the only reason you're doing well in math is so that you can be a math teacher. You do well in math to uh, help your thinking powers. And we see this when it comes to Christian things. Somebody will say, well, I don't want to study the Bible. I don't want to, I don't want to be a priest. But that's not why we ask people to read the Bible. It's to change their lives. So watch out for non sequiturs. We see them uh, oftentimes. Third one, appeal to authority. Here's an authority. This is a real, real situation. Richard Dawkins, he's an Oxford professor, has lots of degrees after his name, says Jesus never lived. So I guess that's true. It's a shame. I was going to be a Christian. But eh, Richard Dawkins is an authority. What's wrong with that? Well, Richard Dawkins is an authority in an area of life, one area of life, in biology. Fine, pay attention to him when he talks biology. He stepped out of his area of authority to talk about history and to talk about theological matters, and he had to back off of this statement. He really did say at one time he, he didn't believe Jesus ever lived, and other people who weren't even Christians said, oh, Richard, Richard, you don't want to say that. That's not true. Anybody who's worth their salt at all, as far as history goes, thinks that Jesus lived. So just appealing to authority, anybody can appeal to authority. The question is, is that the kind of authority that you want to appeal to? Does that person have knowledge in the area that we're talking about? Circular reasoning. What does that mean? Circular reasoning says you, or sometimes it's called begging the question, you start out thinking you're going to prove something, but you just come back to the beginning. You never proved it. And Christians do this. So I gave an illustration up here. God exists because the Bible says so. Well, but can you prove? You haven't proved anything, have you? You haven't given reasons for God's existence besides the fact that the Bible says so. But you'd have to prove why you could trust the Bible. But that was never done. It was just done in a quick circle. Trust, the, trust that there's a God because you can trust the Bible. But... You haven't proved anything yet. You've gone nowhere. You're spinning your wheels. How about a few more logical errors? Something called an ad hominem. Oh, is this popular today among people who don't like Christians? They slap a label on you. If you talk about same-sex marriage and oppose it, or you talk about homosexuality and have some reservations and don't celebrate it like the rest of society tells you to do, what are you labeled with? Homophobe? Or in this case, oh, you Christians are so arrogant, you're an Islamophobe, you're, you're not a good thinker. And I guess the obvious answer is, oh, maybe I am those things, but that doesn't deal with my argument. Labeling somebody is a quick, um, quick way to get out of having to think about something. It's lazy. It's irresponsible as a thinker. Labeling doesn't get you anywhere. You don't label, you look at the argument itself. And so this is called ad hominem. It means to the person. You're attacking the person rather than an argument. Here's something else close to it. A, a straw man. So what's a straw man? It's a fake person. And it's easy to fight a straw man. You just shove some straw in a, in a bunch of clothing and you go pound the cookies out of that straw man. So how does it work when it comes to arguments? Somebody will make a straw argument that's not the real argument and then beat up on it like, see, I destroyed your point. So here's an example. Somebody says, oh, I'm an evolutionist. I'm not a, I don't believe in uh, creation because a 6,000-year-old earth is ridiculous. Well, here's the deal. What the person do was to build the straw man out of a what's called a young earth creationist, somebody who thinks the entire universe is possibly six to 10,000 years old. Not all Christians believe that. And so this person who's built this argument up thinks it's easy to knock it down, but hasn't dealt with the other Christian arguments. Uh, there's a group called old earth creationists. There's another group that are... Um, that believe that God actually used evolution. It's called theistic evolution. So this person didn't tackle the more tough issues that Christianity would pose for him or her, just knocks down the 6,000-year-old earth because they think that's silly. 
But that's not fair to the other beliefs out there that are not the straw man beliefs. Here's another called slippery slope. What does that mean? You start down a slope and you just slide all the way to the bottom. In other words, one event, one vote, one action leads to something terrible. For example, if we vote for this bill, we'll soon all be in concentration camps. Really? You vote for this bill and it automatically heads you down into concentration camps? There's got to be a lot of steps along the way that would have to happen for that to become your concentration camp conclusion. So it's a way of scaring people. And I'm not saying that you, we shouldn't scare people. I think we should talk about hell. We need to scare people if it's a legitimate problem, something that can lead towards something horrific. But we have to be a little careful in this slippery slope. We may be going there too fast. We need to say, how do we end up there? What are the steps involved? Something they call a genetic fallacy. The genes are what you inherit from other people. So look at this. That idea can't be any good. It was a libertarian who came up with it. Wait a minute. What are you doing here? You're saying, I'm not going to deal with the argument because it came from somebody that I don't really respect. Um, I remember years ago, Jerry Falwell, I guess his dad was involved in bootlegging from what I hear. I, don't quote me on that, but a lot of people said I, I wouldn't listen to Jerry Falwell because of his father. Yeah, but you, you're rejecting his ideas based on his genetic background. That, that's not fair. It shouldn't matter where we come from, what our parents have done. We want to look at the argument. Finally, there's something called the bandwagon. Everybody wants to get on the bandwagon. So if you hear something like this, well, a majority of Americans support this position. Is that a good reason? No, we want to look at the position. Just because 51% of the people say, uh, I'm okay with that, thumbs up, that's not a good reason to support it. After all, 51% supported slavery at one time. Probably a vast majority uh, supported Adolf Hitler at one time. So. Just because majority backs it up doesn't necessarily make it true. So those are some logical errors that we want to uh, watch out for. Critical thinkers can express themselves clearly in their writing. I'm just going to go briefly over these, but I hope a lot of this makes uh, sense to you. Critical thinkers can express themselves clearly in writing. I showed you what the outline of a good essay would look like. These are just skills you need to practice on your own. We obviously don't have time to talk about that in great detail today, but every time you write a paper, anytime you write a letter to the editor, anytime you put something on the internet, anytime you have to write something for a class or a memo at, at work, whatever it is, you should always have a thesis in mind. The thesis is just, what am I doing? Why am I writing this? What's my overall overarching point of what I'm trying to get across? So we want, we want to always have a thesis. We got to think about openers. If we're going to write a, an extended essay or an article of some kind, we want some sort of opener. You don't just throw the information at the people. You walk them in through asking a question. You walk them in through telling them a story. You walk them in through telling them the big picture and get down to the point that you want to make. There are a lot of ways to do this. You can look them up on your own. You can um, ask me for information about that. You want clear topic sentences. You're going to write a paragraph to support your thesis. What's the piece of support in that particular paragraph? Have it, have it very clear in that topic sentence. Then you supply the support. That's what you're going to fill up the rest of the paragraph with. You're going to have description. You're going to have stories. You're going to have statistics. You're going to have examples. You're going to have dialogue of people talking. That's how you fill up and make those paragraphs solid, good pieces of support. You want to have transitions and organization. If you have, let's say, three main points, why are they in the order they're in? There ought to be some kind of logical reason. Maybe you're moving through time. So you let the reader know. You say first of all, and then you say later, and then you say after that. Maybe you don't want to organize by time. Maybe you organize uh, more likely by order of importance. You start off with something that's fairly important, something else is important, and then you end with the most important point of all. So you say first of all, you say next, and you say most importantly. So the reader gets a feeling that there's an organizing principle. These are not just accidental things that are flying apart, that this is an essay that's very tightly structured. And finally, you want a conclusion of some kind, possibly remind the, 
the person of what you're writing. Uh, you could just do a look to the future. You can uh, wrap up by reminding people what you told them at the beginning. If you started with a story, you can end up with a story as well. The same story, remind people. So again, this is a lot of information to cover and you can ask me more details if you'd like. But critical thinkers can express themselves as they write. They also recognize three steps when you're trying to figure out what an argument is all about. When you're trying to figure out the point that somebody is making, you break it down into three parts. Very simple. You hear a speech, you read something, you break it down into three parts. Find out, first of all, what is the person saying? What's the belief behind this person as he or she is writing this? So you go, okay, now I know what the person believes. The person believes candidate X is the best person for the job. Okay, now I get it. Next is we want to know what are the reasons? What, what is the support? Well, because the candidate has done this, the candidate has done this, the candidate has done that. Okay, now we've got it. We understand what the main point was. We understand what the supporting reasons are. But we've got to do one more step. Decide if those reasons are strong. Do they really support the point? Does that make sense? If somebody says, well, I've, I think we all vote for candidate X. Reason one, because this person is married. I don't know. We'd have to hear more about that to understand why being married makes that person a good candidate. Uh, vote for this candidate because he or she goes to this church. There again, um, I don't know. I think we need more information than that. So look at what the main point is. Try to figure out the main point. Look for the support. And then analyze that support. Is that reasonable? And that's how you tear apart and look at any kind of argument. This is crucial. Critical thinkers carry a biblical worldview with them. So what's a biblical worldview? It's the way that you look at reality. It's the glasses that you wear as you look at reality. We look at the world from a Christian perspective. We look at what people say, what people do, how they conduct themselves from a Christian perspective. What would that look like? We would know things like the history of the church. We don't understand the history of the church these days. It's all pretty fuzzy to us. But a Christian worldview says, how did we get here as a Christian church? We would read the Bible regularly. Pretty obvious, but uh, many of us don't do that. We would know how to study and interpret the Bible. Sometimes reading it's not enough. We need to dig in a little deeper. We need some kind of study guide. We need a study Bible, perhaps, a commentary, something like that. We can explain, we can understand and explain essential doctrines of the church. Greg Kokel has a new book out that we're going to be going through in our apologetics class at our local church. It's called The Story of Reality. Chuck Colson has a book out called The Faith. Those two, and, and going way back, there are certainly others, but those two do a good job. Mere Christianity might be another one. These books do a good job of explaining what is Christianity, what do we really believe, and why do we believe it? We need to know that. Frankly, Americans are pretty fuzzy when it comes to their theology. Even biblically oriented Christians, born again Christians, are often pretty fuzzy on their theology. And then, this is crucial, we can relate, we can carry those Christian glasses with us, have them on, all week Long, Not just Sunday morning, come here, put our Christian glasses on, sing the songs, go to Sunday school, and then put the Christian glasses off, and go through the rest of the week not even thinking about Christianity. That, that shouldn't happen. We should relate Christianity to our job. How does Christianity play a role in what we do day after day after day? We should have that as part of our home life. What does it mean to be a Christian and to be a father? What does it mean to be a Christian and to be a mother? What does it mean to be a Christian and to be a child? What does it mean to be a parent and be a Christian? We need that in our leisure time. We need that as we watch movies. We need that as we interact with neighbors. Have that Christian perspective all the time. Too many people compartmentalize Christianity. Well, I'm a Christian, but it's Sunday morning, and then I'll live worldly the rest of the week. That, that shouldn't be. Here's a good, uh, maybe a, a wrap-up as we talk about critical thinking Christians. We're humble people. 
This should not puff us up just because we're critical thinkers. That should never be the case. We should maintain our humility. We're fallen people like everybody else. Uh, we've, we're broken people. We need Jesus Christ. We should be gentle as we deal with people. If we find somebody who's not clear in their statements, we don't say that's wrong or that's, that's fuzzy, that's terrible. These are people made in the image of God. We want to honor them. We want to be humble and gentle as we talk to other individuals. We should be willing to say, I don't know. Somebody asks you a question about Jesus. Somebody asks you a question about the church. Somebody asks you a question about the Gospels. And it's a hard question. Our tendency might be to say, I'll give them a real quick answer. I'm not sure if it's right, but I'll just go ahead and give them the answer and hope it's right. Don't do that. We should be willing to say, I don't know, but, and I bet you know where I'm going with this, but we should say, I don't know, but I'll find out, and I'll get back to you. So that shows a, a tremendous amount of humility, doesn't it? To say, I don't know. I did that uh, a few Sundays back. I was teaching a Sunday morning class. Somebody asked me something that was uh, kind of off the wall, uh, way out there, about uh, uh, an ancient book. And I said, I don't know. And people kind of laughed in the class. They said, oh, that's different. And I said, I'm coming back next Sunday. I'll find out. And I did. I looked up some information, came in, and shared it with them. So I don't feel bad saying, I don't know. There are a lot of things I don't know. A lot of things none of us know. So we just have to say, I don't know, but I can get back to you. We should be living, uh, we, we should be able, first of all, to change our minds. We don't want to many times, but if we're speaking incorrectly or we're doing something wrong, we should be able to, to say, oops, I, I need to get better and, and change that. We need to live for our convictions. If we think Jesus Christ is the only way to God, we need to live that way. If we think the Bible is the book that has the truth and it is God's word, then we ought to live that way. We should also be open to opportunities to share our beliefs with others. It doesn't mean we necessarily shove religion down their throats, but we look for those opportunities. If they talk about a movie, remember, you've looked at movies, and many movies have something spiritual going on. It makes for easy conversations. Maybe it's not a movie. Maybe somebody is saying, boy, have I gone through a hard week? That's an opening. That's a chance to talk to that person. I was, uh, one time at, at my college, I was walking toward uh, a classroom and I came across a, another teacher. And this person was just kind of staring off into the distance and just kind of had a thoughtful look on his face. And I said, how are things going? He said, okay. I said, well, you're looking like you're kind of thinking about things. And he said, yeah, I've gone through some hard issues lately. And we ended up with a very deep spiritual conversation there. And you can do that. Everybody can do that. We're just looking for those opportunities to share. And it's not forced on anybody, it's how it comes out as we ask questions, as we look for body language or any kind of a way to, to talk spiritual matters. We tend to shy away from that. But there, the opportunities are out there. We can pray to God to, to reveal those opportunities to us. And finally, we can realize that it's up to God. It's not our efforts that are going to change people. Isn't that good news? I would hate for it to be up to me. I would hate to be in that position to say, if I mess this up, I may mess up this person for eternity. God can use anything we do. All we're doing is presenting the information, just being faithful. That's all God calls us to do. Be faithful. He's the one that's going to make things happen. So that's really good news for anybody, including critical thinkers. So. Resources, if you'd like, Gary at apologeticsforlife.org. I'll be glad to send you information. Uh, if there's anything else I can help you with, go to my website, take a look. I've got a lot of video files there, audio files, and I'm sure you'll find something that'll help you out. So my challenge for you is, I don't want you to think of critical thinking skills as uh, dry, as uh, philosophic, as... Uh, too intellectual. I don't want that to be the approach. We just want to be good thinkers as we go through life. Jesus said we're supposed to love God with our minds. So if we need to do that, then we need to sharpen our minds so that we can interact with people effectively with humility and by being gentle, 
but being more aware of ourselves as thinkers and uh, attempting to be a little bit more critical as we discuss Christianity with the rest of the world.